Praise the Lord. I'm so glad you're here with me today. My name is Michelle Steele. This is Faith Builders broadcast, and we are going to talk about how to make faith adjustments. We want our faith to work accurately. We want our faith to be a constant application of faith on the situations that we're resisting and on the promises that we're receiving. We don't want to be up and down here or there. We don't want to be scattered with our faith. We want to be diligent and proficient. So we're practicing these these faith adjustments and learning to identify things that are hindrances to our faith. In the previous sessions, we've already covered a lot of ground. I encourage you to get this series. Go watch it on our YouTube channel. Go back and, and watch it from our archives on our website. We want you to know how to work your faith accurately. We are specifically identifying in this today's session uh, continuing about the symptoms of faith. We found out that our faith is going to have things that are indicators, our confidence level. If we're confident, if we're trusting in God, if we're, if our voice is reflecting that confidence, and if we are speaking the promise, the word in our words, instead of the problem and the despair, those are indicators. But we found that first of all, we, we know our, our primary text is from 1 Corinthians 13, and it says, examine, test, and evaluate yourselves to see whether you are holding to your faith. That's the Amplified. The King James says, see if you be in faith. The Amplified says, evaluate to see whether you're holding to your faith and show the proper fruits of it. Do you have evidences of faith? Are you seeing your faith at work in your life? So if you're not, he's, it's, it says test and prove yourselves, not Christ, the Amplified says. It's not God's heart if we're not accurate in our faith. God's going to do his part if we'll be accurate in our faith. And so we're identifying, how can I be accurate? What things can I look for to make sure that I'm not in hope? Hope is necessary. It's a part of faith. It's not the application of faith. Faith gives substance to things you hope for. So you need faith. You need hope for faith to work because faith gives substance to the things you're hoping for. But hope by itself is a poor receiver. And so a lot of people are in hope and they think they're in faith because they're hoping God will do it there. And that's how it sounds when they say, I, I'm believing. And that means I'm hoping. And they haven't identified, I'm not yet in faith. If I'm in faith, there are evidences. And Romans 15 has identified these two evidences specific that we're talking about in this session today. It says, with joy and peace in believing. If I am believing, joy and peace are going to be companions to my faith. They are going to be symptoms that I can look for and identify. Yes, Faith is working because I am joyful about this. I'm expecting great things. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do for me in this situation. And that, that, that says joy and peace. That peace is a constant force that we need to identify and that we need to protect. So in our last session, we talked about care, worry, and we identified care as an illegal contraband for the believer. Now, listen, I know a lot of people who love God, but they live care-burdened, care-filled lives. They live worried. They live in turmoil. They live constantly unsure. And they love God, and they want God to work in their lives, but they're not having the right, um, 
they're not seeing the word of God work in their life the way they want to. And this is one of the major, major reasons why is they allow worry. And we've, we've identified Jesus own teaching. He said in John 14, don't let your heart be troubled. He said in verse 27 of John 14, that was verse one. Don't let your heart be troubled. In verse 27, the Amplified goes a step further. He said, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be afraid. Stop allowing yourself to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourself to be fearful, intimidated, and unsettled. If you live unsettled, you are violating this instruction of Jesus. He said, stop, 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 stop. Don't let it. Don't permit it. You have control and you're the only one who has control. Nobody else has the ability to control the condition of your heart except you. God himself is not going to come in and, and do it for you. He's, Jesus said, my peace, I give you. Peace is available for every believer. It's a fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the spirit of peace is available to every one of us. We have to make the choice to cultivate it, to put it into practice and to refuse worry. We have to be obedient to the instruction of God to cast our care upon him. Now, we were talking about how that the cares, when Jesus was teaching the parable of the sower, he said cares are one of the things that will choke out and suffocate. The Amplified Bible uses the, the word suffocate. It will choke out and suffocate the word of God, the word that will not return to God empty. The word that is forever settled in heaven. The word of God that is established in your heart if you allow worry, even though the word, so it's not the word at fault. It's the entrance of care, the entrance of worry. Now, I was sharing with you in our last um, session something that I had read in Brother Hagen's book. Kenneth E. Hagen wrote a book called Casting Your Cares on the Lord. Casting Your Cares on the Lord. And he had, he had received God, Jesus, as his Lord and Savior. He was saved, and he was starting to read his Bible. He was bedridden because it, as a young, I want to say he was maybe 15 when he first went to, he, to the condition that he was bedridden. He had been born premature. He had had issues all of his life. And by the time he's 15, and I think he was in, in that condition for a year and a half of being in bed, paralyzed from the waist down. At times, it was worse than others. His heart wasn't formed all the way correctly. He had a blood condition that caused his blood to be orange. His eyesight suffered at times because of that blood condition so that he could see better in the mornings. At, at night, his, his vision would get really blurry and he couldn't see clearly. He was trying to read the Bible in this state, in this condition. And so his mother, in the mornings, they would cl get him uh, cleaned up and, and prop the Bible up in bed with him. And he would be reading through the New Testament. He said, I started with the New Testament because the doctor said I only had, you know, a few months to live. I didn't have time to go with the old. So I started with the New Testament. And so he said, I got to Matthew chapter six. And it says in Matthew chapter six, verse 34, take no thought. Take no thought for your life. Well, Brother Hagen's heart condition caused him to, his heart would stop beating multiple times throughout the day. And it did this so often. Every time that his heart would stop, he would reach back and grab the post. He had like those spindle posts on his bed. He would grab the spindles on the back of his bed post and he would hold on to his life. And he said he had worn the varnish off those spindles, just trying to hold on to his life. That's how often his heart 
stopped beating. And he came to this verse that said, take no thought for your life. And he said, Lord, and I'm going to read his words to you specifically. He said, dear Lord, if a person's got to live like Matthew chapter six says, I'll never make it. I can't live without worrying. That's as much a part of me as my hands and feet. He went on to say, I went on reading, but I never got a thing out of it. That was the 23rd day of April, 1933. And it took me until July 4th to get out of the sixth chapter of Matthew. What a struggle. I had that July 4th, 1933. At 6 p.m., Mama was by my bed again trying to comfort me. I said, Mama, if you just want to live, will that help? She, uh, will that help any? I mean, just want to live. She said, well, that's about 50% of the battle. I made a little adjustment on the inside of me and said, well, I've got 50% of it made now. I'll lay that aside and go to work on the other 50%. The minute I said that, something on the inside of me said, Matthew 6. I knew what he meant. So the Holy Spirit was telling Brother Hagen, Matthew 6 is part of why Part of the, the key to your winning this battle. I knew what he meant. I turned back to Matthew 6 and I read it. After I finished the 34th verse, I said, all right, Lord, forgive me. I repent. I repent for worrying. And I promise you this day, I will never worry again the longest day I live. I promise you this day, I'll never be discouraged again. I promise you this day, I'll never have the blues again. He said, I didn't know about divine healing then. I hadn't gotten far enough in the Bible. I hadn't gotten over to Mark 11, 23 and 24 yet. So I really didn't know that I could be healed. I still had my physical, con physical condition. It still looked like I was going to die. Not only was I bedfast, but every day I would have three to five heart seizures or heart attacks. My heart would stop and I would think it was never going to start again. I'd fight to stay alive with every fiber in my being. I wore all the varnish off of my bed right down to the bare wood, just holding on. You hold on with everything you've got to stay here. Right in the middle of one of those attacks, I turned loose. I turned everything over to the Lord, fell back on my pillow and said, let her go. I know where I'm going anyhow. I never had any more problems with fear. I still had the heart attacks, but they didn't bother me. I had cast that care upon the Lord. Friend, if Kenneth e. Hagen could quit worrying while his heart was stopping, you and I can quit worrying about our situation too. We can do this. We can determine to be obedient to Jesus' instruction not to worry. And we can see that same victory that Brother Hagen had. He had to deal with worry before he got to, to faith. If, if he would have come to Mark 11, but he would have still been actively, progressively worrying all the time, it would have nullified his faith. It would have choked out and suffocated his faith. And it does that to any time we worry, it's choking something in our heart, in our spirit. It's suffocating something in our spirit. So here's our instruction. Psalm 37, 5. This is from the Amplified Bible. Commit your way to the Lord. Roll and repose each care of your load on him. Each care of your load, not half the load. There, uh, there have been people who said, I could handle it if God would just put, uh, take about half of this that I'm carrying. No, he wants it all. He doesn't want you to be carrying any care. Carrying care is contraband. It's illegal. Don't get caught with it. You, you don't want to get caught with it. Cast it immediately. Roll and repose each care of your load on him. Trust 
lean on, rely on, and be confident also in him. There's that confidence indicator. See, for faith to work, I've got to cast my care and he will bring it to pass. First Peter 5, 7 gives us the same instruction. Casting the whole, that's the amplified, the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns. You're not given any wiggle room with this amplified version, are you? No wiggle room for us. All of your anxieties, all of your worries, all your concerns, once and for all, for he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. He doesn't want you carrying any cares. Isaiah 26, 3 says this, you will guard and keep him in perfect and constant peace whose mind, both its inclination and its character is stayed on you. Oh, he will guard and keep us in perfect and constant peace when our mind is stayed on him. So if I let my mind move over there to the carrying of care, let it go over there and start worrying, then it hinders God being able to keep me in perfect peace. Peace is a necessary flow of our lives. We need the peace to protect us. We need the peace to guard us because out of your heart flow the issues of life. He says, and we're going to read it here in just a moment, that peace protects the heart. It protects the mind. And so with our mind stayed on the Lord, he keeps us in peace. We keep our mind stayed on him. He keeps us in peace. This peace is, it's the word shalom in the Hebrew. This is Psalms, or I'm sorry, Isaiah 26. He keeps in perfect peace those who keep their minds stayed on him. That word peace is shalom, and it means nothing missing, nothing broken. The peace that comes from being made complete. The peace that comes from being made whole. This peace flow is necessary. It is like a supernatural restoration in your life that's at work all the time, restoring you, restoring your mind, restoring your emotions, restoring relationships, restoring. If there's a broken place, peace goes to work on it to restore it. And he keeps us in this constant continual flow of peace so that we are at a continual restoration if we'll keep our mind stayed on him, no worry. So it says perfect and constant peace when we keep our mind stayed on him. That is the, the key. The mind is how the worry gets in the heart. Talking about it or thinking about it is going to put it in your heart. Listening to the wrong reports get your mind thinking about it. Talking about the wrong reports, get your mind thinking about it. Looking on the wrong reports, gets it in your mind, and then you meditate on it till it gets down into your heart. And we don't want it there. So we've got to go, go out here to these areas of entrance and we've got to guard them. What I'm putting my, in front of my eyes, I don't want to look at things. It doesn't mean that I am, I am uh, denying I'm not denying problems. I'm not denying the existence of a symptom or, or a sickness or denying the situation. I am refusing to allow it to get in my heart. I can, I see that that's enough. I don't have to continually fix my attention on it. When I see that that's going on, then I turn my attention to the word and I fix my attention to the word because this is the, this is the, the answer. The promise is the answer. The problem is the problem. <laughs> Don't look at the problem fixing your attention on it. I see it, but I'm fixing my attention on the answer. And that will allow the peace of God to be at work in that situation. Let's read Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Do not fret or have any anxiety. I mean... <laughs> How do you get away from this? Don't let your heart be troubled. Stop it, stop it, stop it. This 
in Philippians is another verse that doesn't give us any wiggle room. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. Do not have any anxiety about anything. Not your children's salvation, not the report from the doctor, not, not the disease. They, they Don't have worry about it. We can deal with it in faith, but worry won't fix it. So don't have any anxiety about anything, but in every circumstance and in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. We're not praying the problem, we're praying the answer. Make your wants known to God, and then what will happen? I'm not worrying about it, I'm gonna pray in faith, and verse seven, God's peace shall be yours. Now, this peace is a force. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. God's peace shall be yours. That tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ and so fearing nothing from God and being content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is, that peace which transcends all understanding shall garrison and mount guard. Garrison is, is a reference to a Roman uh, garrison of soldiers. In other words, it's that peace is setting up a protective circle like a garrison of soldiers around your life. And where? It says over your heart and your mind. So your heart and your mind will be protected by peace. We need that protection. The mind is the battlefield. That's where the enemy's trying to get the wrong thoughts. He's trying to blind your mind. He's trying to blind your comprehension of the truth of God's word. So if we will cast our care, take the petition to God in prayer, thank God in faith that he is working in that situation, peace will go to work and faith will be able to continue. Jeremiah 17 says it this way, Blessed is the man who believes in, trusts in, and relies on the Lord, whose confidence the Lord is, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters that spreads out its roots by the river, and it shall not see in fear when heat comes, but its leaf shall be green. It shall not be anxious and full of care in the year of drought, nor cease from yielding fruit. We want fruitful lives, the word producing in our life. We've got to guard against the cares of this life. I encourage you, go back and listen to this again. Listen to last week. Catch us next week. We're continuing with this joy and peace, and we're going to build your faith and frame your world by the word of God. Examine yourself and see if you be in faith. The Bible instructs us in 2 Corinthians 13, 5 to make this faith examination. When we begin to walk by faith, there are some indicators that reveal whether our faith is accurately working or not. Because faith is a spiritual force, we need to identify when we are applying our faith accurately. The Bible gives us some specific things to look for and shows us some adjustments that we can make to be sure we are in faith. In this six-part teaching, Faith Adjustments, we discover the symptoms or indicators of faith and learn how to make the necessary adjustments so we can stay on track in our walk of faith. You'll learn how to identify faith when it is working, the two main symptoms that accompany faith, what is the energy supply to our faith, and much more. This insightful six-part series is available in digital or physical format starting at just $20. In addition, we're offering Philip Steele's book, Refusing the Care, for a special price of $15. The Lord spoke to Pastor Steele about the dangers of worry, telling him worry will prop the door open to the enemy to come into your life and bring all sorts of destruction. Refusing the care will give you courage to resist every form of worry and anxiety. 
the six-part series, Faith Adjustments, and the companion book, Refusing the Care, are working together to help you operate your faith more effectively. Call the number on your screen now or go to buildfaith.net to order. Call or go online now. I want to express my gratitude to all of those who partner with this ministry. Thank you for being a vital part of what the Lord is doing in this ministry. At Faith Builders International, we are entering our 25th year. We've been broadcasting this program since 2010, over 12 years. During that time, we've received multiple testimonies of people who have been changed by the Word of God through this program. Our partners will receive the same reward that we receive from the part they played in helping us preach the gospel. King David established a precedent in 1 Samuel 30, verse 24, when he said, as his part is that goes down to battle, so shall his part be that tarried by the stuff. They shall part alike. A group of his soldiers had stopped the pursuit and not joined in the battle. But because they stayed with the supplies, the rest of the soldiers were able to ride faster and catch the enemy. David said they receive an equal share of the reward. And that's true about you. You receive the same reward. I want to pray for you. Lord, I ask you to minister to my partners out of the abundant overflow of your goodness and your blessing. Lord, for every time that they have sacrificed, that they have lovingly sowed into this ministry, let this be something, Father, that causes a memorial to come up before you and let the abundant supply of their harvest meet every need in the name of Jesus. We welcome you to join us too and become a partner of Faith Builders. Together, we will continue to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. Faith Builders International is a family church with a vision to build people's faith. Jesus told His disciples they would be witnesses of Him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. So we are building faith, city, state, nation, and world. Our congregation in DeSoto, Kansas meets at 8390 Peoria. And in Little Rock, Arkansas, we meet at 10500 West Markham Street. We have ministry for the children and youth and special events focused on men's and women's ministry. We invite you to join us Wednesdays at 7 p.m. and Sundays at 10 and 6. We look forward to meeting you. Visit buildfaith.net for more information.